What's up guys? Today I'm bringing you back another Q&A, so if you have any questions, post yours down below and let's begin. Hey Alex, can I get away with only doing good mornings as my hip hinge and never do any sort of deadlifts? 100%. And what do you think your boy is doing? In fact, how did I get to a 600 pound deadlift without even doing the exercise? Good mornings, good mornings, good mornings. Good mornings. Took my RDL from 4 or 5 for 5 all the way to 15 reps and then a couple months later, even neglecting my hip hinges, being somewhat lazy, I got four and a half plates for nine reps. You want to talk about carryover? You want to talk about general strength? You want to talk about blowing up your posterior chain? Cable-like spinal rectors? Popping hamstrings? You got that meat hanging off, which you can never have too much of. When it comes to the hammies, gorilla glutes, carryover to your barbell back squats, Beautiful, legendary stimulus to fatigue ratio, getting more out of less weight. Not having to load up five plates or more. You got two plates on your back, two and a half, heck, 300, you're already a freaking tank. How heavy do you have to go? What about the variations? Inverted SSB, high bar good morning with the pussy pad. It don't make you a pussy, but I'm just saying the versatility is unmatched. And this is why I speak so highly of the good morning because I know what it could do for you. I know what it could do for everybody who's trying to get strong. I think guys like Louis Simmons had a right ahead of his time programming for the West Side athletes. When you put in honest work and it doesn't take much, I only the double progression, leaving three reps in reserve. So I'd stick to reps of eight to 10 on average, you know, for volume days, sometimes 15 to 20. But when you do it right, what you can get out of good mornings is just as good as deadlifts. And that's the thing. It's just as good, but it's easier on your recovery. So the question is, why should you deadlift? Well, if you're a powerlifter, strongman competitor, you require that specificity or in general, you want the best deadlift of what you're capable of. Yeah, I'd recommend doing some higher percentage work. Even when using the max effort method, you want to max out on the deads. But if your goal is hypertrophy and even general strength, you can easily get away with good mornings exclusively as well as Romanian deadlifts. In fact, if you don't like good mornings, then the RDL is the next best choice or on an equal footing somewhat. The only con here is it's about 150 pounds more. So there's an overloading factor, but then we could also argue, okay, you're getting the way to stretch on the traps. And I made a whole video talking about RDLs versus good mornings. So I'm not going to mention everything here, but for mass gain, those are the two best options in my sincere opinion. I don't deadlift anymore. I have a deadlift bar. I might just donate it, do a giveaway, sell it. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I barely use it. And except for trap bar deads once in a while, or using my straight bar for RDL, nine out of 10 times, which is me being very conservative, like realistically, it's 100% of the time, I'm doing good mornings because I don't see the point in going heavy when there's no need to. And again, this is coming from someone who walks the walk. You saw my entire journey. You saw the leg gains. The good morning is an exercise I wish I started doing sooner. It's changed everything for me, and I cannot speak highly enough of it. Not only in terms of bulletproofing you, but the overall package. So look, I'm just rambling at this point. I lost my train of thought, but can you get away with only do good mornings? You better believe it. Use proper form. You don't have to go to failure. Rotate variations to minimize overuse. I don't see any issues. Hey Alex, do you ever use or recommend chains for volume rep work or should they only be used for max effort dynamic effort? For example, let's say I do max effort floor press with chains. Could this be used for a sets of 10 or should it be mostly raw weight? Majority of times it should be raw weight, but you can use a common resistance as back offsets provided the tension isn't too insane. And in my experience of doing this for years, I figured out that 20 to 30 pounds of chains is that sweet spot. If you go 60, recovery will be greatly compromised and you might get injured. In fact, a couple months ago, I was doing exactly that on barbell back squats. It didn't matter the variation. Like I remember one workout, I had only two and a half plates on my back and I was doing reps of 10, right? The thing is, that was 365 at the top. And at the time, I wasn't strong enough to handle that for actual sets of 10 in terms of my spinal rectus. Like my legs were okay, but there's other weak links that will start to be apparent. And I felt overuse kicking in rapidly. Like if I listened to my body, I was going to get hurt and you were never going to see the 507 squat. But that's why I had to take a few steps back 
reassess the situation. Same for bench press, less is more. 20 to 30 pounds is all you'll ever need. And in most cases, if it's a back down, you can drop it off completely. Usually, that's what I've done. I'd rather use a higher percentage with straight weight, even if my first exercise was with accommodating resistance. So if you did a 300 pound floor press with 90 pounds of chains, then maybe you could back it down to 80% of 300 rather than doing 70% plus of chains or even 65%. Or if you're gonna use that high chain weight, you gotta use a significantly lower straight weight right after. Similar to dynamic effort. So you know when you got the 25% or 33% band tension like what Louis Simmons recommends? You don't do 65, 70, 70% for the three week waves, right? It's 50, 55, 60, according to Louis. Then you got Matt Wenning saying it's gotta be around 30, 35, 40. Well, it's the same thing with volume work. You have to lower your percentage at least 10 to 25 points depending on how heavy you're going. It's very hard for me to phrase this, but if you're going heavy with the chains, you're overloading, then either remove them completely for the back downs or use a much lower percentage. But in my opinion, it's best not even with that because it's just gonna confuse everything and eventually you're gonna run into recovery problems. It's just not worth it. To me, it's either 20, 30 pounds of chains with a normal back down or slightly less weight or you just strip them off, eliminate all these concerns completely. And in the context of not maxing out, the variables change. So now it's a completely different question. Basically, if you're doing a hypertrophy workout, you hit incline bench, dumbbell bench, and then Swiss bar, close grip bench with chains, you can add more chain tension because now you're not doing it to overload. You're just trying to reduce the bottom, which was already taxed with all the other lengthened motions. So now you're specifically trying to get the triceps, and you don't mind if the delts are slightly more biased compared to the chest. You know what I'm saying? Is it okay to use bands only for isolation work like lateral raises, rear delts, curls, extensions, and pushdowns? I only have a few plates that I use for dips and pull-ups, but no barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells whatsoever. So you're basically doing weighted calisthenics, dips and pull-ups to get the major stimulus, and then you're gonna attempt to isolate with some small band tension. I mean, I suppose that could work, but in no way is this optimal, and I would just say, Get gymnastic rings if you want to isolate in a way that's specific to your calisthenics because how much are you realistically going to progress with these bands? Like if you're not even willing to invest in other forms of basic equipment, my guess is you're doing the same for the bands. Maybe you got micro minis or minis or monsters. You don't have a whole collection. You're not going to buy all kinds of pairs, right? Unless you do. I don't know. But the thing is, bands emphasize a shortened position, right? Which definitely has its merits as it pertains to minimizing overuse and possibly maximizing your hypertrophy potential. But that doesn't change the fact that the lengthened position is generally most favorable. This is what all the data is pointing to. Or the mid-range if some muscles do not benefit from the lengthened position. So if you're taking out those two to primarily emphasize the squeeze-based motions, that is already a significant compromise. And that's why with people who use bands, it's always recommended that you also hit an opposing resistance profile. Like, that's what I do. I've never done bands only. Even when it comes down to band face pulls, I'll also do cable face pulls. If I'm doing band curls, there's a specific reason for that. It's not to maximize my bicep size. In fact, I do those for elbow health. Make sure that my bicep tendon is on point. And the thing is, with bands, the progressions are limited because at some point you'll have to use much higher repetitions, like well over 30, so the hypertrophy outcomes are not equal. Not to mention the resistance profile being even more favorable towards the top. So now you got something that you're basically just pumping, but you're not stressing yourself in the range where you actually need the most. So that's why I'm saying the rings would be more beneficial because now you're gonna be dropped to a normal rep range, at least one that is best suited for hypertrophy, less fatigue, and then you can adjust your body angle to make it more difficult. Like that is the way. And then bands should supplement that just for injury prevention and ensuring that we do have the squeeze in there, but it's not the main driver. So the only way this is really gonna work is if you haven't maxed out your bands yet and you're hitting a muscle that generally benefits from the shoreline position. 
but I would not use them as an isolation tool for optimal hypertrophy. Like if you're already doing weighted calisthenics, come on, man. Why don't you find something else that's also weighted? Like get a rope, like what natural hypertrophy recommended, tie that to those plates and do some curls that way. Like yes, resistance is resistance, but some forms do it better than others. And bands are usually a compromise if we're comparing the two equally. What's your opinion on hack squats? Can it be replaced for regular squats? And have you ever tried the exercise? Of course I've tried it, there are clips of me doing it. Am I a fan of it? I'm kind of neutral about it in terms of personal sensations and enjoyment, but regarding hypertrophy outcomes, I would say it's a 10 on 10 movement. And you can absolutely replace barbell back squats, leg press, bell squats, any motion you could think of. If the goal is to build your quads, the hack squat can replace. Now, does this mean I don't recommend free weights? Absolutely not. This is my preference and it's what I will continue doing. And no one who gets a very impressive squat using traditional hypertrophy rep ranges is gonna have weak legs. So before some guy comes and says, oh, power lifters, this guy's squatting four, 500 pounds, just skinny legs, shut the fuck up. I'm tired of these examples. I don't wanna see that shit in my comment section. These are outliers. These are not the majority. 99% of you guys watching this will get big, juicy, meaty legs doing barrel back squats if you take the time to properly focus on them. So don't tell me that they're a bad hypertrophy movement. No, they're not. Hack squats might have a slight edge when it comes to stability, but at the end of the day, there are many ways to skin a cat. So going back to your question, yes, hack squats are great because of the additional knee flexion, the fact that your spinal rector and overall core strength is not gonna be a limiting factor. You're at that angle where it's less posterior chain dominant. Of course, you can adjust your foot placement being higher up, but at the end of the day, the hack squat allows you to go maximally heavy higher proximity of failure without all the other factors that can cause you to fail the squat that's not actually quads, which may be your goal. I can't think of any real cons for growth. And me personally, when I get down to single digit again, I'll most definitely do more hack squats just because I'm gonna have less energy. I don't wanna have to be super stable. It's gonna be easier to just push myself, you know? Not saying you can't do that with the back squat, but for those who, been lean like that, you know, with all these freeway motions tend to be absolute hell. So in a way that actually does build discipline and character, but you'll notice a lot of natural bodybuilders tend to shift their focus to more machines when they get contest lean. You know, I might do the same, no idea. Or if I don't, whatever. This is not something I think about. To me, they're all great tools to be incorporated. If I go to a gym, I'm gonna do a hack squat. If I'm at home, I'm gonna do barbell squats and belt squats. It's that simple. What is your current view on internal rotation while elevating elbow as upright row is getting popularized now? I would agree that there is no such thing as a bad exercise. It's all about load management and find the positions that work best for your anthropometry. In that situation, most people can probably do upright rows if they find a style that works for them. Or in general, if they're able to do this without any pain with their body weight, that's proof that eventually you can work up to doing a loaded. You might have to start with a very lightweight, perhaps half of what you initially expected. But as long as you slowly microload your way up, I don't see you getting injured. You know, we, we can talk about the specific physiological factors that has done a tremendous job at fear-mongering all of us, but let's look at the real world. Let's look at what happens when you program correctly to minimize overuse and actually find variations. Cause let's say you are sensitive, actually, find variations that you can work with. So for me, I'm just gonna say bluntly, I can't stand the upright row. Now, this is not a knock on any of my colleagues. I got nothing but love and respect, but it feels terrible for me. Like I, I've tried everything. It doesn't agree with my build. You know, that and wide grip benching. Those are the two things I can't do, but behind neck pressing is fine. Now, if I do, this is with the barbell, by the way. If I do a snatch grid upright row, it's a bit more doable but I'm not really a fan of the motion. And with dumbbells, yeah, that's fine. Cables is also fine, but from a muscle stimulation standpoint, I don't really care for it. So that's just personal preference. It doesn't mean it's a bad movement or that I'm now gonna get snapped up. Once you eliminate black and white thinking, you look at the other options available, then it certainly becomes possible to make upright rows a main staple. So if you love them, you're getting great results so far, keep doing them. But you're certainly not gonna see upright rows in my programming. 
Like I don't, I have no intentions of doing this. Like if I want to get more yoke, I'll just use my expander. I'll do more wide grip pull-ups, more rows, like side raises if I want the side delts. What do you think about mixing in rings and dumbbell benching? I found regular weighted dips were making me some issues in my shoulder after overtrained about a few months ago and it became super unstable. Now has recovered somewhat, but still weighted dips cause me some issues, but weighted ring pushups feel super stable. Plus dumbbell, amazing benching, really helps my imbalance. I'm asking because both movements are supposed to stress the stabilizer. See, that's the thing, right? You're doubling down on that stabilization aspect, which in my opinion is not the best way to blend. Now, if you're strictly a calisthenics athlete and you want the best ring performance possible, then sure, we can say dumbbell benching is more specific for that. So it would make sense in this context to use movement patterns and implements that somewhat resemble the rings. That absolutely makes sense in the ring specialist context, specifically. And I must emphasize that. But if your goal is hypertrophy, doubling down might be inferior and redundant. Because what's the benefits of dumbbell benching compared to barbells, at least on paper? We have a converging effect and you can potentially get a bit more range of motion in the bottom with lighter loads exclusively never with heavier weights unless you tuck in this position here for the bigger dumbbells to clear your body so in a normal situation where maybe you're an intermediate lifter or you're just high repping it so that's probably what you would also do on the rings well aren't you getting a similar training effect and if we know that unstable movements are worse for hypertrophy can we argue that from a blending standpoint, it would be better to mix in ring push-ups with perhaps weighted deficit push-ups done off plow boxes or parallettes or the flat ball bench press or machine bench press? Does that make sense? We can either pair the same stability profiles if the goal is specificity or we can do the opposite. Or we can eliminate all confusion by doing it all either on the same day or another day so day one you can do ring push-up and bench press or deficit weighted push-ups and those are easy on the shoulders i know how you feel with the dips that's a lot of people and then on the thursday push day you can do ring push-ups and dumbbell bench so now you get the best of both worlds and you can even change the rep ranges on those days or even invert the order or one workout is ring push-ups off the floor. The other one is with your feet elevated. To me, that makes more sense than doing the exact same motion exclusively just because you're trying to get everything as unstable as possible, which is actually a compromise for hypertrophy in the truest sense. Do you prefer penlay or regular barbell rows for upper back hypertrophy? Regular barbell rows. I used to do a lot of penlay rows in the past, but I was probably influenced by uh, strength athletes who were constantly talking about the benefits. Oh, it's dead stop, concentric only, easy on recovery. You can always match the eccentric loading by doing pull-ups on the side, but all that is inefficient and still inferior from a one-to-one -one comparison basis. So I would just say, do most of your rows where you're not breaking up the motion. You want that stretch in the bottom, in the length of position, the most hypertrophic part of the lift, keep some tension on there. And the thing is, so many guys use absolute tier form on penlay rows, which is easily spotable. Even those who say, oh, look how strong I am. Just put the video at 0.25 speed or even half, okay? And see what they're doing. The, the torso is never in a single spot. It's they're lowering it to try to catch it the moment it touches. So right here, they'll lower it and then re-extend. So done quickly, it looks like proper form, but when you actually break it down, they're cheating and using their hips. There's a reason why guys hit way more weight on penlay rows compared to seal row. Even if the seal row is dead stop, which I would actually say is a better movement. So I'm just gonna say this, the penlay row is, because I don't want some guy to come in and say it's a bad exercise. No, the penlay row is a great mass builder and will certainly get you stronger and improve your deadlift. But regular barbell rows are superior as are other variations. I would say a cable row, a machine row, a chest supporter row. It doesn't matter what variation you do. You're doing a horizontal pull in which you're not breaking up the eccentric concentric chain. That's going to be better for growth. And you know what? If I'm being really extremist, I can probably extend this to other muscles as well. In general, when we got the stretch 
and the squeeze that's not broken up into boom, boom, but continuous or pausing in the length of position, which is different from stopping. On average, that tends to be better for hypertrophy. So by that logic alone, we can say penley rows are somewhat of a compromise. But like I said, in some cases, they could be good if you're trying to get a deloading effect on the lower back, or if you are going to make up that eccentric volume by doing more stuff on the side. So my answer is nuance, but one to one on paper, it's clear who the winner is for muscle mass. What is your opinion on Zercher lifts? I used to think very highly of them, but I haven't done any throughout this entire year. And my spinal rectors, upper back, everything has become significantly stronger. I've been doing SSB squats. I feel like you get all the benefits you'd want from that. Just reverse it. Actually, <laughs> comparable benefits to front squats even without having to learn the form. So both of those, although amazing, and you notice how this is the theme of this Q&A? What's your opinion on this? What's your opinion on that? Everything is good, but it's about what's slightly better, right? SSB squats are the f***ing king, period. Zercher squats are somewhat of a compromise. They're less stable, and they tend to give less carry over many cases. Front squats, same thing. They're not more quad bias than a high bar squat, and it's not better than a heel elevation. But it's good for reinforcing thoracic extension. That could be one of your weaknesses. So going back to Zercher's, what are they great for? Upper back. They're good overall squatting motion. If you don't have access to specialty barbells, I'm definitely going to program them in for you. If you don't have an SSB and you're running conjugate, it's a good way to spice up your training. It's great for combat athletes. It's functional, quote unquote. But are they the secret to unlocking your yoke and leg gains? No, not really. And anything that you can do with a Zercher, you can find something else that'll get most of the benefits you're trying to seek in a generalized lifting context. I'm not talking about those who are very specialized for specific athletic goals. So that's generally how I feel. As someone who used to do a lot of Zerchers, you know, I've done 435 on that. Nothing too crazy. You see me do 507 squat in recent times, so I could probably Zercher way more than 500, at least when I was bulked up. Never bothered trying, but I honestly don't care to. So yeah, man, if you like them, you do them. In my opinion, they're kind of overrated. Though if you're using them for lunges and stuff, I think they're actually pretty good because I'd rather have the bar in my hands where I can maintain a more upright position than having the bar on my back. Then if I got to dump it, it's harder to do, you know? And it's harder to maintain that position because of the torso lean. But the Zercher can drive all of it to the legs. But when it comes to squats, it's a different story. You can often hinge the movement or just change your torso angle in a way that allows you to go way heavier than the back squat. Like some people, the gap is massive. So you gotta keep yourself accountable. In a different video, you say close grip pull-ups are better for lats. Can you clear this up? You also say use hollow body, but this video will say the opposite. Which version will get you wider lats? They'll both get you wider lats and it all depends how you're doing them. So when you do the close grip pull-ups, first of all, I'm talking about the neutral grip. So around here, contracting this way. And I say hollow body because you want spinal flexion. We're not doing this to be calisthenics athletes or arbitrarily state that like we're specifically trying to maximally lengthen the lats and by having the humerus tight and close to the body we get the best lat squeeze for this close grip specifically because we're pulling like this okay whereas with the wide grip the form is completely different and the reason it works a lot so great is because of the plane of motion that we're in. In addition to the fact that around nine degrees of shoulder adduction, you do have good leverage. So you know how people are talking about 120 degrees of shoulder flexion. So there's a certain range that when you go beyond, your lats are no longer under tension. Well, what happens when you go through the range of motion, AKA get to nine degrees? Well, now they do have good leverage. So we can even argue that doing a reverse banded pull-up would be slightly more lat biased if we're using this variation. So that's why it works. And with the sternum pull-up, which is what I've been showing you recently, you get a super squeeze. So maximum shoulder adduction. And the lats do a lot of that. So by default, it has to be a great mass builder. Now, if you're doing little partials in the bottom, that's a bit different compared to doing the exercise properly 
full range of motion. And regarding spinal extension, you kind of have to a little bit in order to maintain that fully vertical movement pattern. So I can even show you right now. So this is super wide. If I do hollow body like this, it's a bit harder than doing it this way. So it's also less feasible for most of you. So both variations can build the lats. I say mix in both and understand that there's always nuance when we talk about form differences. In my opinion, the neutral is still gonna be number one, but this is still a great runner up. Like, yeah, you're gonna get some solid trap, rhomboid, and Terry's major simulation, but that's a lot of it in the bottom. So provided you're not doing partials, wider pull-ups will build sweeping lats. And you know what? Maybe that's another reason why my lats improved this year. Sure, I started doing this other stuff, which I talked about in this video on how my back improved, but what else was included in there? The wide grip pull-ups, I've been doing them the whole time. So perhaps they were an X factor that further assisted my growth. So they all work. That's my answer. Would you ever get into arm wrestling? Well, for all my OGs, you know that I used to talk heavily about arm wrestling for one reason, one reason only. I was impressed with their form development. What I recommend for you is arm wrestling. There's actually a guy who's, who has a tiny body everywhere. He's tiny. But the only thing that's developed is his right form. His right form is massive, dude. And that's from arm wrestling. So even today, I continue to train like an arm wrestler. And I'm going to show you the strategies that I use. So everything that I learned back then came from that world. I was that guy watching these old videos on YouTube that barely got any views. It was like crappy webcam footage or like cell phones. I don't know what these guys were filming on, but there were... Seminars and a lot of them were Russian on top of that. So you had to use the automatic Caption to know what they were saying and I remember Devin actually did have a seminar from way back So I learned from those greats, you know, actually one of the first videos I made on this channel was in 2013 I talked about Dennis Siplinkov way ahead before all this was popular. I was discussing arm wrestling, but not for the sport itself but to grow massive juicy forearms because I do believe that's the best way. Like there's different sports when we talk about the forms, right? There's a grip sport, which a lot of it is like open hand strength and pinching and all these things that pertains to grip. And then there's the arm wrestling way, which is a lot of flexion and pronation, rotation, all that stuff, right? And that's what I found is unmatched. So you best believe I know who these guys are, but it wasn't as an interest for the sport. And that's what I realized with time. When I first went to the Toronto Pro Show back in 2018, I competed in this arm wrestling competition and got absolutely wrecked by everybody. Guys who were way less jacked than me. Perhaps we had comparable form development, but there were guys that were significantly skinnier. There's no way they can lift anywhere near my amounts, but I was not able to budge them. For one, their wrist strength, it would bend me back all the way. It was on a completely different level and their technique was refined. And this is what they were training to do. Like they, they had worked for months getting ready for this competition. I just came in last second. Okay, I'm gonna, because I'm a strong guy, because I got this big ego and I've defeated steroid guys at the gym, which is the actual truth. I've beaten guys who were 250, like jacked, huge muscles at arm wrestling. But arm wrestling is a skill. It's probably because I did a little bit of it when I was younger. But then you put me up against the real deal and it's like, oh damn, I'm nothing. So I used to think I was a good arm wrestler. Now I realize, hell no. I don't even stand in amateur competitions despite the muscle mass and despite the fact that I do have big forms because what it takes to be good, man, you gotta be hella specific. You gotta do the table work. Most of these guys are part of a group. They show up frequently to spar with each other. It's a whole lifestyle. It's a whole community. And it's not something that I am interested in. So although nothing but respect, I can look at what these guys are doing for hypertrophy inspiration of the forms. I don't see myself ever competing in arm wrestling. You know, what I do see myself doing is stepping on a bodybuilding stage and displaying my muscle. All right, final question. If I do deficit push-ups, should I still include dips in my program or they are enough? Can I do them after a handstand push-up, OHP, or works better for primary exercise Finally, should I do vertical press, deficit push-up, and add dips as well? Thanks. 
in my opinion, they're best done as a primary exercise. Though, we can also argue that because deficit handstand push-ups are slightly more unstable, you should prioritize them first to maximize your motor unit recruitment and depending on how strong you are, be in a good rep range for hypertrophy because I don't think guys realize how hard they are. Most people can't even do three sets of five on that movement if you're doing proper form. So I would say this, depending how strong you are, if you're already getting reps of 10 and beyond, no matter what state you're in, then you probably want to end your workout with deficit handstand pushups. Or in general, if even after all that, your delts are still lagging, then from a specialization standpoint, we can start with the vertical first. But that's for a very select group of people. It's not the majority. I would say your delts get worked enough in most cases, like from all the push-ups, dips, everything we do in the calisthenics world, the handstand should not be the main priority. Like it really supplements everything that you do. So in my opinion, if you did deficit weighted push-ups, weighted dips, and then handstand push-ups, that's the correct order. And keep in mind, you can eliminate the redundancy by changing the angles of these motions. So when you do the deficit push-ups, they can be done off a decline to hit more upper chest. And then the dips, that's already lower chest by design. Though for that, I would actually state the deficit push-up stretches you even more if you look at the arm bend in the bottom. So maybe you want something that's super stretched and then something that's also maximally stretched but not quite as much, which dips will do. So what I'm saying is even when we talk about emphasizing the length and range, there's degrees to that. Like in a lifting context, there's the McDonald's bar, which is like a huge camber. And then there's your traditional camber, which is like a rainbow or more like a buffalo bar or like my arch nemesis bar which has more of a stretch the mcdonald's style right well it's the same thing with calisthenics we're all stretching but they're not created equally and then the muscle biasing has to be factored in as well as overuse as well as the movement patterns and being the best athlete you can be like in this video on deficit push-ups i stated that they might be better than dips for most people that doesn't change the fact the dip is still a legendary mass builder. So my question is, even if one has a very slight edge in terms of being easier on the shoulders, your structure, and also being more stable when you do hypertrophy work, in no way does this imply I'm not recommending dips because I still do them, the regular part of my program, and I'm probably never gonna stop unless one day they just don't agree with my anthropometry anymore. But as long as I can load them safely and effectively, why would I cut out this important motion? To me, it's a no-brainer. You want to mix in everything, be maximally jacked and stacked, all right? Even if you have a preference, mixing is always the best solution. So with that said, I'm done this Q&A. Hope you enjoyed it. Let's see some more questions down below, and I'll see you in the next video.